You're on mute. You guys are on mute. We can't hear you. Can you hear us now? Yes. All right. Let me start over. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, everybody uh, this afternoon for this lecture. We have the great pleasure of having with us Professor Indibar Kamkaker from Center for Historical Studies, Jawala Nehru University. And uh, he's going to speak to us today on the subject of the differential impact of the Second World War on India. Uh, very warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, we know that the Second World War was undoubtedly the most important episode or event in the history of the 20th century and I can say till now. And uh, the Second World War has been studied uh, uh, for its implications, consequences, causes, processes, etc, etc. Uh, in all parts of the world, but especially in the Western countries uh, where its impact was more than its impact in other parts of the world. One of the questions that arises about the world wars, especially the Second World War, was in what sense can it be described or should it be described as a world war? And the reason uh, we describe it as Second World War, and this is a question that has often occurred to me, is probably that because the protagonists may have been uh, obviously uh, just a few countries, but uh, it involved all the countries because they had colonized the other parts of the world and the consequences of the Second World War and also of the First World War, though to a lesser extent, influenced all parts of the world. And therefore, in that sense, it was the most important event in the history of the 20th century. I believe that today Professor uh, Kamtaker is going to speak to us about the impact of the Second World War on India, but in a differential sense, in the sense that, you know, he's going to analyze uh, at a micro level its impact on different regions of India, on different classes of India, so on and so forth. So I think that uh, it's going to be a very, very uh, a meaningful uh, uh, lecture and interaction later with Professor Kamtaker. With these few words, now I would like to invite Professor Kamtaker for his lecture. Please, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak at uh, the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library today. Uh, many scholars, and I am among them, have done our research in this wonderful institution ever since our student days. It therefore has a very special place in our hearts. Let me also thank all of you who have taken the trouble to come here to attend uh, physically or online. I'm sorry, we are a little late in starting. The title of today's talk is the differential impact of the Second World War. But the argument which I'm going to go through, which I'm going to develop, also seeks to promote an approach to modern Indian history. Now, nationalism is undoubtedly a contributor to, um, to uh, academic historical insight. But I'm going to argue today that nationalism can also be, is also at times, an enemy of historical insight. And I'm going to try to promote an approach which encourages comparison between classes, regions, and nations. In what follows, I'll try, above all, to insist on the need to look at the relationship between the state and social classes. And I'm going to say that in India, we have a case which is quite different from that in Western societies. Let me make one or two more uh, remarks by way of preface. Can you please, you know, this thing keeps, uh, there is a sound which keeps interrupting. Please uh, take care of that. I apologize. So uh, I just asked that the sound which keeps coming in between, that yeah. it be muted, you know, there is. Uh, yes. yes. So some more uh, prefatory, uh, remarks by way of preface. We all grapple with various questions over the years. We struggle with the questions of our intellectual upbringing. Now, my upbringing, as, as many of us, um, as is the case for many of us, has been Indian nationalist. And I'm going to ask the question, what are the things which using a national category of analysis closes our eyes to? And I'm going to say that one of the 
marks of nationalism is an underplaying of comparison within the nation and comparison with other nations. In fact, I'm going to make the further claim that sometimes using the nation as a category confuses our understanding. The other question which underlies this rather detailed analysis is what does colonialism mean apart from rule by foreigners? What kind of power is late colonial state power? Now, it's true that it's exploitative, but can one go beyond merely saying that it is exploitative? What else can one say about the nature of colonial, uh, late colonial state power? So we have um, what I'm saying is that the question of is colonialism good or bad is has been done to death. How does one go beyond that question? I'll be looking in particular at the 1940s, which in our history are primarily the years of independence and partition, or at least in their depiction. How else does one look at that period? Usually, these are years seen in terms of constitutional negotiation, maneuvers of politicians, mass mobilizations, and we have a lot of social history of partition. I'm going to propose another way, plus there will be an empirical finding which I'm suggesting should be part of our textbooks. So these are some of the areas. Much of modern history has been written under the influence of imperialism and nationalism. These are intoxicants, drugs of a kind, which are often successful in instilling solidarity and pride. But they often also blur our vision in ways easy to identify, but more difficult to rectify. Two methodological moves proposed today and attempted in combination aim to bring into focus some blurred issues within modern Indian history. The first move is a comparison between the activities of state power in India and in Britain during World War II. The second move I'm going to make is a comparison between the trajectories, fortunes, misfortunes over the same period of time of social classes and regions within India. So we are going to look at Indian history from above the category of nation through international comparison through below the category of nation by comparing regions and classes. And that way we will see a view which the category of nation, I'm saying, obstructs, as if this is an obstruction to our insight. There's a shift of emphasis here. Um, there was an official history of the Indian Armed Forces in World War II, but by and large after that, historians have dealt with independence and partition. <clears throat> there has been some uh, interest in World War II, more recently with the books by Yasmin Khan, Srinath Raghavan, and others. Nevertheless, the study of the period is heavily weighted towards independence and partition. In history writing, in historiography, it is as if the drums of decolonization and independence proved louder than the drums of war. When economic and social history are brought into the picture, uh, they provide a kind of backing or backdrop to dramatic political events. History books have mentioned the screens the war imposed on India, inflation, shortages, the Bengal famine of 1943. They've lamented about the suffering of the, which accompanied the partition of Punjab in 1947. The Advanced History of India by R.C. Majumdar, which was a standard textbook once, has a, <clears throat> has a section titled The Hard Lot of the Common People. And this more or less sums up that approach. If you um, fast forward from there to the new Cambridge history of India, that takes the line, I quote, that the second, I quote, the Second World War had a devastating effect on economic life in India, unquote. Today, I'm going to qualify uh, that picture especially by presenting an untapped vein of data about rural India, but there's going to be a more radical shift of emphasis. I'm going to analyze the 1940s in India, not in terms of political negotiation or mass mobilization, <clears throat> but in terms of enhanced resource extraction. Enhanced resource extraction. I will explain 
uh, how this is a kind of analytical knife with which we can cut into this subject. The starting premise is that states inaugurate wars and then try to make them the business of the people over whom they govern. A modern war therefore tests the state, not just on the battlefront, but also on the home front. During wartime, a state's appetite, hunger for resources increases. War requires a state to make unusual demands of society and to extract greater resources than usual from it. The extent to which it can do so, the manner in which it operates, can be instructed. It is as if the state's new burst of energy and activity provide a flare of light which enable us to see its features more clearly. It is as if a match is struck and you can see the features of a state. A match in the darkness. Using such a flare of light, we'll ask how were resources mobilized by the colonial state in India during the Second World War? How was the war effort run? What results did this entail? By glancing at the conduct of the war in Britain, from where India was ruled, the situation in India comes into sharper focus. Neither Britain nor India was actually invaded. Well, Northeast India was to some degree, but the two states, the colonial state and the national state in Britain, did not fight in the same way. And I'm going to argue that this war dance, so to say, of the colonial state tells us a great deal about the character of state power in India. What follows is in two parts. First, I'll discuss over maybe 15 minutes uh, what the state did, what were the activities of the state. And then we'll shift here and we'll spend the remainder of our time looking at what results the activities of the state had on Indian society. So first, the state's activities. The Second World War caught the state in India looking in the wrong direction. From the late 19th century, for decades, British defense policy had assumed that if India is attacked, the attackers will be Russian, and the attack would be from the Northwest through Afghanistan. But when India was attacked, the attackers were not Russian. They were Japanese. They didn't come from the Northwest. They came from the East. They didn't come through Afghanistan. They came to Burma. Although Assam was the only province to be actually invaded, its neighbor Bengal was also severely affected. Many war factories were concentrated in Bengal. Many thousands of troops from Britain, the U United States, African countries, Australia, China were stationed there. And at various times, especially when refugees poured in from Burma in 1942, Japanese invasion seemed imminent. So although only the eastern fringe of India became an active center of operations, the whole country was sucked into the war effort. India wasn't a major battlefield, but India was a major supply base in World War II, contributing heavily with men, materials, and money. Men, materials, money. We look at each of these three in turn. First, manpower. More than two million Indian men joined the Indian Armed Forces during the Second World War. These soldiers served in Africa, the Middle East, Burma, and Europe. Some units became legendary, like the 4th Indian Division. Now, in the literature, especially in the military history, stories about the army are very proudly told as if there is a military band playing in the background. The government of uh, India at the time boasted that the Indian army was the largest volunteer force in history. How do we look at this? In a strictly legal sense, the men were indeed volunteers who enlisted of their own will, but there is a but. Once a man joined the army, once in uniform, the recruit came under the eye of army doctors. And army doctors are impatient of euphemisms. They talk straight, unlike social scientists many of the time, much of the time. Medical investigations, uh, investigations showed, I'm quoting, that most of the fresh recruits of the Indian Army were underweight and anemic. 
the army doctors performed what they called feeding experiments on the new recruits. They monitored the weight of a soldier on the standard army ration. After the war, some of these doctors published the results of their research. Uh, they were published by the ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. Um, they are housed in the library near the All India Medical Institute. It was found that, quote, irrespective of age or initial weight, every recruit gained five to 10 pounds of weight on basic army ration alone within four months of enlistment. And this gain continued at a diminishing rate thereafter, unquote. This is what it meant in terms of access to food and medicine to join the army. And this is why the so-called volunteers joined the army. If you multiply two million by five pounds of weight um, gained by a soldier over four months, that's a lot uh, of weight gain. The malnourished young men who enlisted bore little resemblance to the ideal soldier of the British Indian Army. Ever since the late 19th century, the best Indian soldier was supposed to be a tall and light-skinned, fair, peasant, wet, wheat-eating, healthy, handsome, loyal, simple-minded, not too intelligent, strong, and from the northwest of the country. This is an almost nonsensical collection of attributes. And when you have this kind of nonsense, it can be dignified by an almost social science -y term. They gave it the title, the martial race theory. In peacetime, this theory of recruitment ensured that the Punjabi peasant provided the backbone of the army. In wartime, when the army became fat through its intake of malnourished soldiers, the Punjabi peasant backbone began to give way. The second highest number of recruits came from Madras, which is almost the opposite of Punjab in our Indian imagination. The Madrasis who joined, more than a quarter million of them, were mostly agricultural laborers. So this is the end of the type of army to which the Raj was accustomed, or at least a major change in it, where son followed father into military service and loyalty was assured. Many Punjabi Jatsik farmers, families, had a tradition of military service to the British, which went back to the 1850s. The expansion during World War II reduced the offspring of such families as a proportion. This is why the new soldiers seemed less reliable. In fact, in 1943, Churchill's fear that the Indian Army would turn against the British led him to contemplate a drastic reduction in its size. He said, these people will stab us in the back. There were various problems with the colonial Indian Army not just because new groups entered, but because they had to operate modern equipment with which they were totally unfamiliar. During World War II, the Indian Army became more technical. Cavalrymen used to caressing horses were in the Middle East given trucks to mount instead. The number of accidents was large. One general whom I interviewed recalled how the driver of a jeep having to drive over a ditch, he said his driver, um, on his first day at work, deliberately pressed the accelerator instead of the brake, had a terrible accident, and complained to the officers who visited him later in hospital that the new machinery was useless because any horse would have galloped over the ditch or the cut with ease. So he said the driver saw a cut, he pressed the accelerator as if he was on a horse, and the thing collapsed. And he said, this is the kind of problem we faced. Comparison of the Indian Army with other armies makes the limitations clearer still. The Indian Army multiplied tenfold from two lakhs to about two million plus. But in Britain, where conscription was introduced, the mm -hmm. army multiplied 25 times from two lakhs to over five million. In America, the army expanded 80 times from about two lakhs to about 16 million. How many people died? The Indian army suffered between 30,000 and 40,000 fatal casualties. But about 300,000 British soldiers and another 400,000 Americans died at the same time. And these figures are far short 
of the perhaps over 3 million German, over 7 million uh, Russian military casualties. Moreover, there's another difference between casualties in our society and casualties in uh, British society. The casualties in British society cut across social strata. For example, the elder son of Anthony Eden, British foreign secretary, you would say foreign minister, uh, from 1941 to 1944, was killed on the Burma front. Maurice Hallett, who was governor of UP, United Provinces, presided over the annual police day parade in Lucknow, the day after he was informed that his son had been killed. There is an almost filmy quality to this. Uh, he is told that he doesn't have to preside, and he says, uh, this could be a dialogue from a film, am I the only man who has lost a son in this war? He then presides, he, a blood vessel bursts, he loses an eye at the time. Even the Viceroy of India gets a telegram uh, to say that his son is seriously wounded, no details. And he is informed in a while that his son's right hand is slightly damaged, but the left hand has been amputated as a result of wounds sustained on the Burma front. So this happens to the person who is in uh, what is Rashtrapati Bhavan now, Viceroy's palace then. The point I wish to underline is that the Indian upper classes for whom joining the army was a matter of choice. In Britain, there was conscription. For Indian upper classes, joining the army was a matter of choice. And the Indian upper classes were much less vulnerable. Let's now turn to supplies. The Indian army required and received supplies, guns, food, uniforms, sheets, blankets, medicines, everything an army needs. India's chief industrial contribution was textiles. It was said at one time that India provided the gigantic amount of 1.2 billion yards of cloth per annum. So that it was said that India closed the allied armies east of the Suez Canal. While language calling for a great leap forward in production was used in India, actually production in India could not very increase very much. And this was because in India, machines were not made. Machines were imported. And because of wartime restrictions on shipping, the ships were being used to carry soldiers, etc. Uh, there was indirect protection, of course, to Indian industry. But it also meant that in India, existing machines could be worked around the clock. But new machines could not be brought in. So production in India didn't increase much. By contrast, British production increased a great deal. By 1943, British production of bullets, tanks, and ships was eight times as large as in the first three months of the war. The number of aircraft produced was 2,800 in 1938, uh, just under 8,000 in 1939. It rose then to 20,000, and uh, even Indibar, you're on mute. The meeting is muted. Indivar, Indivar, the meeting is muted. To those people able to afford very high prices for them, almost all items of consumption remained easily available in India. So we've done two out of three manpower materials. Now, what about money? War finance posed two major problems. 
by what financial arrangements were Indian resources to be put at British disposal? And how were these resources to be raised from Indian society? No doubt the simplest financial arrangement would have been a confiscation of Indian revenues, but the era of Robert Clive was over. A financial agreement reached early in the war divided the costs between the government of India and the British Exchequer. The payments due to India would be made in sterling in London, but they would be credited to an account which would be blocked so as to be unavailable to India for the time being. Thus arose the issue of what were known as the sterling balances. Now, there's a complicated uh, set of formulae in this, but the essence of it is that because a voluntary financial contribution was out of the question and loot was impossible, a forced loan from India to Britain provided the answer. Even this, there were misgivings about. Churchill, convinced that the arrangements were unduly favorable to India, argued for a revision of the financial settlement. He was told that it would be unwise, India would resist paralyzing the war effort. The Secretary of State for India, the major British politician uh, dealing with India at the time, and it's interesting to see how he talks, he remarked, and this we have in the record, that when you are driving in, he told Churchill, that when you are driving in a taxi to catch the, to the station, to catch a life or death train, you do not loudly announce that you have doubts about whether to pay the fare. So you don't tell the taxi driver that you're not going to pay. You want to catch your train. And the situation in India was similar. This meant that while the war was on, it was the government of India which had to raise all the money. P.S. Lokanathan, a contemporary economist, later the director of the NCAER, National Council of Applied Economic Research, with its office near ITO Delhi, uh, he calculated that, roughly speaking, and now I'm quoting him, the war witnessed a threefold increase in the intensity of fiscal pressure, unquote. In other words, in real terms, compared to its war, pre-war expenditure, the colonial state spent three times as much by the end of the war. Loknathan went on to add that this level of public expenditure, I quote, is unprecedented in our economic history. So this is the essence of what I'm talking about. I said that enhanced resource ex extraction provides a kind of analytical knife with which we can cut into this subject. If government of India has to increase taxation or resource extraction um, in the next five years by 300%, we will get a very good idea of the balance of power in our society. So this is unprecedented. This is the flare of light, which enables us to see class relations and social relations. How did the British manage in their own country? <clears throat> the means employed by the British state to raise resources from the British people were taxation and borrowing. Taxes rose steeply in Britain. The excess profits tax, 60% at the start of World War II, was raised to 100% in May 1940. 100% tax on profits means basically confiscation of all excess profits. Moreover, lending money to the state in its hour of peril through savings certificates, post office, savings bank, defense bonds and the like, was projected as a patriotic virtue. The amounts borrowed were substantial, about 3,000 million pounds uh, annually, which is very roughly the amount of annual taxation in Britain. So through loans from the public, the British state was able to get an amount equal to its taxation of the British public. And similar expedients were tried in India. Levels of taxation were raised, saving schemes were announced by the colonial state. But Indians who could afford to pay high taxes proved unwilling to do so. The Indian public showed no urge whatever to contribute to the state's finances. Why should it? On the contrary, there was actually a withdrawal of savings in post office savings banks. And this is important because the banking sector was not really developed at that time. So, yeah. Accounts were very often in the post office bank. 
There was also an a scramble for the encashment of currency notes. People felt if the Japanese invade, then coins will, because of metallic content, retain some value, but currency may become worthless. So they closed bank accounts and tried to put money in coins. <coughs> Silver one rupee coins were drained out uh, of circulation according to the Reserve Bank of India. They practically disappeared from circulation. The economist John Maynard Keynes described the crucial problem of Indian war finance <coughs> as, I quote Keynes, the main problem of the government of India arises out of the fact that they have made very poor progress with their war borrowing program, unquote. His calculations showed that, quote, on balance, more loan money has been lost to the public than has been gained from it, unquote. This was quite the reverse of the British situation. The immediate impact of the war was a widespread move among the people of India to distance themselves from the financial apparatus of the colonial state. So we have a situation then where taxes and loans fail to raise enough money to meet war expenditure in India. That leaves one solution, the money printing press. Industrial production could not be expanded in India for lack of machines, but there was still this one marvelous machine to which the colonial state could turn for salvation. If war finance in Britain can be called a taxing or borrowing business, in India it can be called a printing business. There was an outpouring of paper currency. The amount of currency in circulation in India multiplied about six and a half times during the war years. So this provides a clue to the nature of the colonial state. It could not successfully manage taxation, enforce rationing, or control prices. So it resorted to printing paper currency. The printing press became perhaps the most productive machine in India. And if you uh, do not increase production and print more money, then the inevitable result is inflation. Food prices in Britain kept in check by a system of subsidies, rose only about 18% during the war. 18% over six years, more or less the same. In India, the price rise was, on one estimate, about 300% for rationed foods, and of course, much more for food uh, outside and items outside this. So we've seen some things about the functioning of the colonial state. Uh, I'll now move on to what results did this have on Indian society. But if I may, I'll treat myself to a lozenge uh, in time. Social results. What was the impact of these activities of the colonial state? The picture which emerges varies with both region and social class. In India, as elsewhere in the world, the upper classes are more difficult to investigate than the lower. It is easier for us to question an agricultural laborer or industrial worker of the many things which wealth, the ability to evade scrutiny is not. What this means for us as historians is that while statistical data may be used for the lower classes, for the Indian upper classes, especially when earnings are not reported, for the Indian upper classes, anecdotal data are often more reliable. I'll now go through various Indian social classes to see what happened to them as a result of war. Let's start with the business class. The war gave a boost to Indian business. Before the war, there had been a slump during the depression of the 1930s, and stocks, for example, of textiles had accumulated with manufacturers. After the war began, there were orders from government and stocks were quickly sold. 
The Income Tax Investigation Commission set up after the war said that, quote, the conditions created by the war brought about a serious breakdown in the working of the income tax department. Unquote. They basically couldn't track the money generated. One highly successful business at this time was DCM, Delhi Cloth and General Mills, run by Lala Sridham. There is an authorized biography of Lala Sridham, which describes the prosperity of the war years. And while it proclaims the integrity of the DCM group, it describes others in harsh tones. It talks often about widespread hoarding and black marketing. Uh, and it remarks that in 1943, in conditions amounting to a cloth famine, the textile industry in India officially declared the largest profits of its entire career. Moreover, it says that the general impression was that the undisclosed net profits were three or four times the figures disclosed. There was a wave of enthusiasm and enterprise among industrialists of various kinds. Industry did well because imports were curtailed by lack of shipping and because Japan became an enemy and because large purchases were made on government account. In Bombay, a businessman invited to address a symposium of the Indian Sociological Society, this is in the early 50s, declared frankly, I'm quoting him, I am a businessman of the 40s and I have seen nothing but prosperity in business, unquote. The situation, as we have remarked in Britain, was very different. Profits could not be of the same order uh, because the British businessman operating in a more formally organized economy could not evade taxes so easily uh, and excess profits tax was 100%. There was a black market in Britain, but there is agreement among historians that the black market was never very large. And to quote um, a standard work, uh, the black market was never very large and people did not treat the war as an opportunity for a great display of dishonesty. Unquote. In India, so we see a contrast. In India, production increases slightly while profits increase a great deal. In Britain, production increases a great deal, but profits don't increase much. Let's move from the business class to India's peasantry. And here, there may be a kind of surprise in what you hear. For much of India's peasantry, the Second World War meant the tremendous relief of awakening from the nightmare of the 1930s, which had been dominated by the Great Depression. During the Depression, prices of agricultural products had fallen catastrophically, and peasant earnings fell with them. But in the 1940s, agricultural prices rose, and with them rose the spirit of much of the countryside. Inflation lightened the burden of debts, money, rents, and land revenue. The same amount of produce in the early 1940s fetched two or three times what it would have earned five years earlier. Old demands remained fixed in money terms, uh, and they could therefore be met in this inflationary situation by selling a half or a third of the produce previously required to meet them. The problem of rural debt, rural indebtedness, about which there were many government laws, much attention, was, according to the RBI reports, quote, relegated to the background almost to the point of being forgotten by August 1943. And the economist P.J. Thomas of Madras University wrote a pamphlet called uh, Wartime Prices, P.J. Thomas has also been referred to as the Malayali Keynes. So we have the British Keynes and the Malayali Keynes. Uh, he wrote, quote, in India, owing to the wide prevalence of small scale production, the number of producers is large and the advantage of high prices is reaped by a very great number of persons, unquote. According to him, it was, quote, certain that the cultivating classes have obtained larger net incomes than before, unquote. Such opportunities came to them only once in a blue moon. There's another kind of evidence for this. We can see some of these processes unfolding at the level of one village through the observant eyes of M.N. Srinivas, 
perhaps the most distinguished Indian sociologist of his generation. In his celebrated book, The Remembered Village, Srinivas described the Mysore village in which he lived during his 1948 fieldwork. Chatting with Srinivas, I'm quoting him now, several villagers contrasted their present prosperity with the poverty of the interwar years, 1918 to 1939, unquote. Rice was very profitable, so was sugarcane. Villagers made gains mainly from sale of their produce on the black market, where prices were very high. Controls existed not to be obeyed, but to be evaded. Every villager with a surplus, according to Srinivas, had sold as much as he could on the black market. And Srinivas concluded, I'm quoting him again, the increased prices for agricultural products since World War II were a crucial factor in the economic betterment of the village, unquote. It's as if in various ways, the black market brought color into rural life. Villagers traveled to the towns more often. Sons were packed off, not daughters, sons were packed off for an education in urban areas. Urban contacts changed rural values. Earlier surplus cash among the rural rich would have been invested in jewelry and land. After the war, some of the cash accumulated in wartime provided the capital for new enterprises like shops and rice mills. In Srinivas's judgment, men who would otherwise have remained landlords became, his uh, phrase, incipient capitalists. So what he's saying, in effect, is that the war changes not just the rich villagers' income, but the outlook also. Perhaps the best view of such changes is from the citadel of colonial state power, the province of Punjab. Though far away from the front, Punjab was closely linked to war activities. It was, as we know, the traditional recruiting ground of the army, the employment soldiers who sent remittances home. It was also a food grain surplus producer, and it sold much wheat. Malcolm Darling, an Indian ICS officer, Indian civil service officer of Punjab Garda, who authored classic works on the Punjab peasantry, looked at their lives with a keen, keen and trained eye. One sign of the new prosperity, which he commented upon, was the much larger number of silver ornaments which women were wearing. Bracelets, anklets, rings, he notices peasant women are wearing much more. Less ostentatiously, prosperity was enjoyed by sipping tea. Evening tea, evening chai becomes to be taken by a majority of villagers in Punjab at this time in World War II. So drinking tea is very much a returned soldier's habit. It comes in to Punjab substantially with World War I. It's, uh, soldiers are given tea as part of their ration, then this is a habit or other which continues when they go back, and it spreads through the recruiting areas because of World War II. Malcolm Darling concluded that, I quote, on the purely material side, there were many changes for the better. The 300% rise in prices, which set in sharply in 1942, had put more cash into the peasant's pocket than had ever been there before. And he had wisely used it to pay his debts and redeem his land. For the first time for at least two generations, debt was no longer a millstone round the peasant's neck. With the demands of the moneylender greatly reduced, and those of the government satisfied by the sale of far less produce, the peasant had much more left for himself and his family. Unquote. Debts to cooperative banks and money lenders were liquidated. So it was a good time to be in debt because you could, um, your income increased if you were a peasant with a surplus to sell on the market. There's another kind of evidence which comes from the Punjab Board of Economic Inquiry which sent investigators into the villages. One of them, who went to Ludhiana district, Ramswarup Nakra is his name, he chose different words to this effect. He called the war a boon for people in general and a windfall for cultivators. And he also stated categorically in the report that, quote, on the whole, the cultivator in this tract was much better off financially than he ever was before, unquote. But what he did, which is interesting for us, is he corrected the current Punjabi sayings in the villages, the Kahavats, at the time 
and we can look on them, we can call them perhaps the proverbs of prosperity. So what were people saying? One of them was, all are enabled to get their bread. Sare roti khan lag ne. Then there is another saying in the villages of Lodhiana, he records. It's a saying or a sneer. Even servants have put on clean clothes. Nok rande chitte kapde. Another saying. The war and the high prices have brought about equality. Jang te mehengai sari ikko jai ho gai. So he collected these sayings from the villages. Contemporary assessments of Punjab portray the war almost as a fairy tale time when more gold and silver were born and there was much more ghee and tea and so on and so forth. So we've discussed the peasantry. What about the Indian middle class? Here the picture becomes a little more complicated and it varies above all with age. Indian middle class experience of the war was mixed. For the young, life became easier. Middle class jobs suddenly became available in plenty. At first, unemployed young men looked for jobs. Then employers looked for people to employ. Recruitment rules had to be relaxed. College hostels, where many young men had been condemned to education because of lack of employment, the hostels began to go empty. In North Indian parlance, we would say there was a pomegranate for each patient, ek anar, ek bimar, unprecedented situation. Everybody is taken care of. Middle class youths are now recruited by the army or in the mushrooming departments handling civil and military supplies. According to the reports of the Planning Commission of the 1950s, the problem of educated unemployment was solved for over a decade till it reappeared about 1953. If you we were young and educated, you got a job. But for those already employed, the war meant a falling standard of living. Inflation hurts, wounds the recipients of a fixed income. Two surveys in Calcutta carried out by the Indian Statistical Institute, ISI, in 1939 and 1945, so this is the institution of P.C. Malanovis, revealed the wounds of the Bengali middle class. How would you judge these? Well, perhaps by something like the price of fish. The price of fish had gone up five or six times. The consumption of milk was halved and the consumption of eggs had fallen to a quarter of the pre-war figure. No wonder the great historian Jadunath Sarkar, for most of his time, a uh, life, a teacher in government employed, wrote bitterly to a friend in 1949 to the other historian, Sarpe Sai. Uh, this is his letter written when he was 78 years old. He writes, the government of India, the present and its predecessor during 1939 to 47, having robbed me of four fifths of my wealth by issuing bogus notes and base metal rupees, I have been compelled in my old age to earn fresh money if I am not to exhaust all my savings by spending them on my current monthly expenditure. Bitterness grew, especially at the lower levels of government service. So among the middle class, the young are happy to have jobs, but people who already have jobs, clerks, teachers, uh, become increasingly impoverished and enraged. If we look at the working class, then again, employment increases, longer hours are worked, but the real wage falls. There is a Harvard PhD thesis on this subject by S. A. Palekar on the period 1939 to 50. Uh, and he shows that the real wage of factory workers declines by 30% in the four years 1939 to 43. So this again is interesting. The highest industrial profits coincide with the lowest real wages. Both occur in 1943. Highest profits, lowest wages. This was, again, contrary to the trend in Britain, where Ernest Bevin, the leading trade unionist, became Minister of Labour with a seat in the cabinet. During World War II, the wages of labour in Britain rose by 80 percent 
while the cost of living increased by only 31%. While the condition of the British working class improved, the condition of the Indian working class deteriorated as it struggled unsuccessfully to retain the pre-war standard of living that it only regained by about 1949 on the Palikar estimate. There were rapturous descriptions which I quoted about the prosperity of Punjab. Why? One reason is that agricultural laborers were at this time relatively few in Punjab. The Agricultural Labor Inquiry of Com uh, Committee of 5051, 1950-51 covered the whole of India. It was actually the first detailed survey uh, of agricultural labor in India. And it revealed that on average, 85% of the wage of an agricultural Laborer is spent on food, 85% of income on food, and yet in 96% of the cases, this provides less than the minimum number of calories, which are nutritionally adequate. Commenting on this, the economist V.M. Dandekar of the Pune Institute, he said, what is poverty if not this, that your income goes on food and even that doesn't give you the minimum number of calories. Over most of India during this period, prices of grain rose faster than incomes, further distressing this already impoverished class. If 1939 is taken as base year, then um, the index of uh, wages in Madras at the end of the 1940s is about 300. Uh, and the index of food prices is over 400. So food prices are increasing much faster than uh, wages. And that means, in effect, that hungry agricultural laborers, people who are already hungry, don't have enough nutrition, become still hungrier during the war. This process of impoverishment reached its height in Bengal, which displayed during the Great Bengal Famine of 43, the country's most gruesome misery. Food in Bengal meant primarily rice. Rice was, even for many people in rural Bengal, an item to be purchased. The price of rice rose phenomenally, becoming too high for the poor to afford. Agricultural laborers were by far the worst sufferers in Bengal, but fishermen, transport workers, were, rural artisans were also affected. Peasants, large or small, tended to escape. <clears throat> the famine began in the rural areas early 1943. By July 1943, starvation in the districts was on the increase. Destitute people boarded trains for Calcutta, hoping for food. Military personnel had to take over the daily removal of corpses from the streets. Then came epidemics. Malaria killed the most, followed by cholera, dysentery, diarrhea, enteric fevers, and smallpox. More people were killed by disease than outright starvation. In sheer scale, the tragedy of the Bengal famine bears comparison with any other of World War II and it dwarfs other incidents in India, including the partition riots. The number of Bengalis who died was perhaps half the number of Jews killed in Hitler's so-called final solution. It lends another perspective to note that the dead outnumbered the entire Indian industrial working class. In this period, there were about factory labor was about uh, 2 million, perhaps. And while about 30,000 Indian soldiers died during World War II, the number of casualties in the Bengal famine was 100 times this number. So these are also, in a way, war casualties, but 100 people died due to famine compared to every soldier who dies on the battle. To understand this in contrast, we note that British social history followed an opposite trajectory. The British government initially expected that food rationing, long hours of work, and the general worries of war would damage public health. Exactly the opposite happened. This was one of the surprises of the war. Aware that a healthy workforce was important to the war effort, the state, wa the state watched over its health anxiously. Food supplies were controlled as never before. Prices remained stable relatively. The rise in the cost of living was low. Food was abundantly available to farm laborers and industrial workers who were increasing their earnings with very positive results. The year 1942 saw a decrease in major infections and of record breaking, they say, in vital statistics like maternal and infant mortality rates, the, British pro the proportion of stillbirths 
the death rate among civilians are the lowest ever recorded in English history. The British Food Survey Committee of the mid 1950s uh, in its report said that, I quote, from a nutritional point of view, the working class diet was probably more satisfactory in 1944 than at any time before the war. Unquote. So while starvation deaths occurred in India, the less privileged classes in Britain improved their quality of life. The richer classes in Britain were at the same time more heavily taxed. Rationing, which covered the whole country and used the slogan of equal shares for all, became a symbol of the state's fair play. According to Norman Wright, the chairman of the British National Food Survey Committee, the controlled economy with full employment and a strict rationing of basic foods led to, I'm quoting him, a great reduction in group differences of all kinds. Unquote. Remarking that most people were better off, the historian A.J.P. Taylor reasoned, quoting, quoting him, broadly speaking, the entire population settled at the standard of the skilled artisan. This was a come down for the wealthier classes. It was security for the masses such as they had not known before. Unquote. In British history, there has been a debate on the issue of what they call a leveling of class. The debate is, has it occurred, to what extent, and for how long? If the distribution of property is seen as a marker of class, then change is slight. If income is considered, then the change is greater. And if everyday consumption is taken as an index, then leveling is much more in evidence. But I want to stress that such a debate about the leveling of class is unthinkable in Indian history because Indian society has moved in a different direction. In India, the scales of starvation and prosperity were both obvious and both scales were new. Between classes, chasms, gulfs had opened in the levels of food consumption. Let me draw towards a close and tie together the strands of this argument. There are various analyses of the 1940s, and indeed I have analyzed them in different ways. But what I've done today is to try to systematically investigate the differential impact of the war. Punjab, Bengal, business class, agricultural labor, peasantry, etc. Among regions as among social classes, the war in India produced both victims and beneficiaries. Some people starved, other people ate more than they had ever done. It's fairly accurate to claim that Punjab prospered, Bengal suffered. The wartime economic boom, especially this agrarian boom in Punjab, is neglected in historiography. I've emphasized it in today's lecture. This economic boom was politically relevant, I think, providing in the short run some bags of cement, so to say, to strengthen the colonial state. There is ample evidence for it, as the descriptions I quoted indicate. But why has it been neglected? Perhaps because there was awareness of the Bengal famine and people modulated their behavior accordingly, quietly enjoying the prosperity of Punjab, not an answer. And then we had the partition and partition riots. That was a tragedy about which there is a lot of writing. So the prosperity of Punjab, which I've highlighted today, was engulfed in history writing by misery in India elsewhere at the same time and by Punjab's misery a few years later. Two shadows fell on it and made us forget it. By contrast, the tragedy of the Bengal famine was publicized. Here was conclusive proof of the evils of imperialism. While the starvation of Bengal validated the messages of Indian nationalism, the prosperity of Punjab was, in a nationalist way of thinking, an inconvenience to be overlooked. Arguments over causes and numbers have persisted over the years. The Official Famine Inquiry Committee Commission estimated 1.5 million dead. Later, the econo economist Amartya Sen calculated 3 million. And there's a subsequent study that says 2.1 million would be more accurate. So the essential point is that despite all this statistical fanfare, the number of dead can easily be wrong by as much as 1 million. And I'm putting to you, 
that this is the aspect we need to think about. The, so little was known about the victims of the Bengal famine. They lay beyond the myopic gaze of the colonial state, where numbers are hardly known, one million more or less. Where numbers are hardly known, voices are unlikely to be heard. If we judge the significance of an event by the mortality involved, then the Bengal famine must unquestionably rank as the most important event of the 1940s in India. But if we judge by its impact on state power, the famine doesn't matter so much at all. Why? Because those who died were mainly agricultural laborers. The real victims of the Bengal famine were the rural poor. In a situation where franchise was based on property and education, they were not on the provincial voters list. So if they were on the provincial voters list, you would not be asking, are the numbers dead 2 million or 3 million? Although many people died in the streets in Calcutta, few actually belonged to the city. City dwellers were safe, covered by various food schemes. It was the rural poor who came to the city to die. For all their misery, they remained marginal. The dead were not articulate actors in the theaters of modern politics. The great Calcutta killing of 1946, when about 5,000 people were slaughtered, threatened the Bengali Bhadraluk, and a furor followed. But the children of the Bengal Renaissance were unharmed by the Bengal famine. If a beggar died on a doorstep, it was no doubt a terrible thing. But it is an essential part of the upbringing of the Indian middle and upper classes to learn to ignore at close quarters the clamor of the destitute. The Great Bengal Famine was a colossal human tragedy, but cynically, no cause for political panic. Those who died in the Bengal Famine could not even be counted properly because they counted for so little. So I'm saying that India did not suffer during World War II, although many Indians did suffer. In reaching this conclusion, there has been methodologically an underlying premise. So, the Bengali agricultural laborer is as much an Indian as the Punjabi peasant who is eating more. There is much more to Indian history than meets the imperialist or nationalist eye. A national category can easily generate much outrage. Regional and class analysis, as well as international comparison, can sometimes generate more insight. International comparisons are instructive. If not at first glance, they help at the second. Wars evoke among allies the rhetoric of a common effort. What I've tried to do is to probe beneath the words, the rhetoric, and the superficially similar enhancements of state power into the content of words like war effort and rational. The rulers of the state in London and Delhi shared the same language, but the two states function in utterly different ways. As colonial politics are often alleged to be molded by British political culture, the distinctions are important to recognize and reiterate. And in times when other words, words like economic planning, privatization, globalization are bandied about, the distinctions are relevant to remember. Just as rationing can mean bacon in one society and rice in another society, the point is that similar vocabularies can conceal different realities. The thread running through this entire talk has been the stark contrast during World War II between the war effort of the state in Britain and the colonial state in India. Now, no doubt, aspects of this can be qualified. I'm suggesting more insight is gained by the contrast. The contrast clarifies two different types of relationship between the state and social classes. And here is where I'm trying to go beyond the idea that colonial rule is good or bad. The claims that colonial rule was civilizing and good 
or the cries that it was exploitative and cruel leave something unsaid. And that is what we are going to clarify. The state in Britain was able to command men from all sections of British society, including its upper echelons, to join the army. The colonial state could not compel men to join the army, but attracted some of them by offering economic benefits. As far as war materials went, Britain expanded her industrial production. In India, where production could be expanded little, the requirements of war were met mainly by constricting civilian consumption. Although production expanded, British consumption was also curbed by an effective system of rationing, which included the upper classes. Consumption in India was diminished by a rise in prices, which left the upper classes unscathed, unharmed. British war expenditure was financed by taxation. Indian war expenditure was financed by printing paper, which led to inflation. Prices remained stable in Britain. In India, they increased more than threefold. Such different state activities produced startlingly difficult social results. There occurred some leveling of British society, but the war widened the cleavages within Indian society. <coughs> in Britain, war ra rationing brought about a greater equality in the consumption of food and a definite improvement in nutrition. In India, even as the more prosperous sections of the peasantry gained from the rise in agricultural prices and the profits of industrialists flowed like water through the tax net. About 3 million people died in the Bengal famine. During the Brit Second World War, the British upper classes were forced to send their children to the battlefront to curb their own consumption and to contribute large amounts to the national treasury. At the same time, desperate though it was for resources, brutal though it was to the Indian lower classes, the behavior of the colonial state towards the Indian upper classes remained comparatively gentle. The Indian upper classes could not be conscripted. Their consumption could not easily be curtailed. Their profits could not effectively be taxed. In India, few sacrifices were required from the powerful social classes. On the contrary, as we've seen, very substantial sections of Indian society benefited very substantially. So, you have a situation where both states are working desperately to extract resources, but they cannot select identical targets for resource extraction. Faced with the emergency of war, the British state squeezed the British upper classes, whereas the colonial state starved the Indian lower classes. Moreover, in Britain, a successful war effort required the state to satisfy the sectional interest of the British lower classes. In India, it required the state to satisfy the sectional interest of the Indian upper classes. Overall, the war effort in India was run on the terms of, and indeed to the benefit of the upper classes. This was not the case in Britain. What does it suggest when a state fighting a prolonged war, desperate for additional resources, fails to squeeze much out of the wealthy or powerful classes? And here comes a theoretical formulation. A relationship of power between the state and social classes is revealed with unusual clarity in such a case. The formulation is, in its relationship to the upper classes of society, in its relationship to the upper classes of society, the late colonial state in India was, compared to the state in Britain, a much weaker creature. In its relation to the upper classes of society, the late colonial state in India was, compared to the state in Britain, a much weaker creature. This relationship left a legacy. In subsequent decades in independent India, we have seen the state swell, become swollen enormously, employing many times more manpower, spending many more times, many times more money. But the time when it can effectively extract resources from the dominant classes has not completely come, even today. Thank you very much, sir, for your highly illuminating lecture on this subject. Uh, it was indeed a very, very powerful and very original argument 
and it was as much a pleasure to listen to you today as it was in my student days. So I uh, uh, heartily thank you uh, for uh, accepting our invitation and delivering this wonderful lecture here. Uh, we are now open to, and uh, let me also add that this has been one of the longest lectures, you know, that I have seen in Nehru Memorial, and okay. we have all been spellbound. So all the participants have been there because we were so engrossed in listening to you that nobody has left the audience. Sir. So, well, thank you. I'm this is a measure. This is a measure of uh, the interest that everybody has in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, we have uh, some time for uh, some brief questions and comments. Please go ahead. Hmm. Yeah. So, is there some problem? You can raise your hand on directly ask the question. Looks like there is some problem with your uh, mic or something. Um, any other question? See? Mr. Mathri Prasad is trying to ask. Looks like there is some problem. Uh, I think we will take up the questions from the audience later. I have some uh, uh, brief uh, questions of my own, sir. Uh, in the meantime, we can take them up probably. As I said, that it's a very, very powerful and original argument with detailed evidence that you have given uh, to us here, sir. Uh, and the point that you raise is that uh, the essential point that I gathered that you make in the course of your lecture is that actually the binaries of uh, colonialism versus nationalism cannot really uh, adequately uh, sort of explain uh, the differential impact of the Second World War, one between India and Britain and two between different regions of India and different classes of India, the upper classes versus the lower classes you know, the, the rural poor versus urban poor, etc., etc. And uh, I certainly completely agree with you on this point. However, the question that arises out of this, to my mind, uh, is this, sir. Uh, was it not uh, intrinsic to the very nature of colonial power in India that since it was not uh, as organic a power, obviously, the power of the state in India as it was in Britain, where it could successfully sort of, you know, uh, recruit the upper classes where the sons of uh, prime ministers, viceroys and, and other such important people could suffer. Obviously, because it was a colonial power in India, it would have been impossible for them, except at the cost of jeopardizing their alliances with the elite in India to demand that level of sacrifice from the upper classes. Wasn't it natural that the upper classes would have benefited under any circumstances in that kind of a situation? And this was something that was bound to happen no matter what the British policy, uh, you know, tried to uh, do in India. And second, uh, obviously, the, the thing is you raised that very important question about how the nationalist discourse in India has uh, painted uh, the Second World War's impact on India in purely negative terms and especially the a Bengal famine, because it was such a tragedy, has been highlighted and emphasized by everybody, by uh, by uh, the nationalist leaders, historians, and even economists like uh, Amartya Sen, whose career, of course, uh, you know, uh, grew out of uh, his work on uh, on this subject. So uh, that being there, but isn't it uh, also true that the prosperity that happened, uh, that came to some parts of India, like you give the example of Punjab and Mysore, which provided large recruiting grounds for the soldiers who obviously, you know, came back and they brought some money with them. And obviously uh, there was a certain rural prosperity in these parts. But wouldn't we say that this rural prosperity obviously was nothing as compared to the tragedy of the death of large numbers of people in Bengal. So probably it's very natural that, you know, the, 
the, the death of the untimely death in famine of large numbers of people would get more highlighted, whether it is nationalist discourse or any other discourse. I mean, it seems like a natural sort of for any historian to, to emphasize. Sir. And thirdly, some uh, very small things here, of course, sir. Uh, you have given the example of how so many soldiers in India, when they were recruited, they were anemic and they were underweight. So far as I remember uh, that uh, in, in, in the case of the Second World War, certainly, but also in the case of the First World War, even in Europe, towards the later stages, a very large proportion of the soldiers who were recruited uh, in the European countries, uh, they also suffered from these problems, of course, because uh, there was a point beyond which you had to sort of recruit the less desirable material as soldiers. So this was this is just a you know a, a side uh, sort of point that I wanted to make. Sir, Please. would you be kind well, enough? Okay. <laughs> well, there's a substantial set of points, so I'll react <laughs> to them and maybe the, maybe what, if there is a tech problem, it will be solved yeah. in the yes, course sir. of yes, sir. Uh, in the course of my reply. Um, and yes, you know the recruitment in the British Army has often been from the urban areas, so it's uh, not been the kind of rural recruitment, which has been characteristic of the Indian Army. But you've said that this was how it was bound to happen. And let me take that as a success of my argument that it seems natural once it is said. In fact, the position of Indian nationalism is that Indian business is throttled under British rule, that everybody is suffering, that there is a, a huge damage to the Indian elite. This is the self-perception of Indian nationalism, that everybody suffers under British rule, that there is a contradiction between the interests of the whole of the colony vis-a-vis uh, -vis the British. And I'm complicating that picture. The other thing about, from a nationalist viewpoint, is the Bengal famine tragedy not greater than the Punjab prosperity. This hits at the crux of what I'm trying to say, which is that one has to clarify what is the point of view from which one is writing. There is a, if you look at it from the point of view of the peasantry of Punjab, which is substantial, then this is not a time of tragedy if you are looking and they are Indians as well. So I'm saying, you know, you can call us whatever uh, and I'm making the further claim. So in analyzing India, I'm putting on the table from whose point of view are you speaking? If you're speaking from the point of view of the Bengal agricultural laborer, it is a tragedy. If you're speaking from the point of view of the uh, Punjab peasant selling uh, grain, then it is a time of prosperity. Who is to decide who is Indian and who is not? So I'm trying to clarify and let me make the stronger case that the idea of a nation, therefore, is somewhat weaker because class divisions are widening in our society. So if you're looking at a conscripted society, then war can be a very powerful nationalizing influence because everybody, after all, stands a risk of being killed in British society. So that is bringing their society together in a way in which the colonial society is being divided. Now, again, uh, let me rephrase. Would the colonial state, wasn't it natural for the colonial state to mobilize in this way? You know, one can put the same question in a different way, that the two cases are not identical. But one can ask the question in this way, that how can a state run a successful war effort? And World War II is the biggest war in our history in the 20th century. It is six years. Uh, so nothing, no war with Pakistan, China is comparable in terms of duration and intensity compared to this. How does a state run a war effort without nationalism? One can reformulate the question in this way. And therefore, how is a national state somewhat different from a colonial state? So one can do that kind of reformulation. Um, you know, again, so let me stress this point that the underlying message is awareness about whose point of view are you writing Indian history from? And I'm saying that's an answer. Uh, there is no straight answer to this question. 
because our society is a class society the british society is held up as an example of a class divided society i'm saying compared to indian society british society is a much more equal society ours is much more a class or caste whatever you call it society we are and that is our reality uh, which i think we need to be very alive to in our history writing the other way of putting the same point is if you ask yourself the question where would you rather live at this time again there is no straight answer to this because it depends on who you are if you are rich then you would much rather live in india because you do not stand a chance of being sent to a battlefront if you are poor then you will starve here but you will be taken care of in british society so again the the thrust of the thing is from whose point of view let us put that question on the table i hope that clarifies to a little degree uh, definitely I sir i as i said uh, at the very beginning uh, you know it's a very powerful and original argument that you have made that the impact of the second world war on india differed uh, so vastly from one class to another and from one region to another uh, and you have adduced so much evidence in the favor of this argument and i have absolutely no quarrel with it the only limited point like i would like to uh, make further uh, is that sir uh, when you talk about uh, the fact that generally the nationalist discourse says that there was a fundamental contradiction between the indian interest and the british interest yeah. i mean the main argument given by the late professor bibin chandra and so many other historians of modern india uh, i think that that argument uh, does not sort of ignore the fact that in the second world war the capitalists and the upper classes so far as i remember i would stand corrected um so far as i remember that argument does not exclude uh, the fact that the second world war benefited uh, the capitalist class the upper classes in india to a very large extent as compared to the poorer sections of the society from what i remember i think that's a general argument that is used for uh, uh, so this is a minor thing that no, in, in fact you know again this is important because the argument in uh, the bipin chandra argument is that war causes a loosening of links that is the phrase he uses between britain and india and this is to the benefit of india now to my mind that is an extraordinary claim when 3 million agricultural laborers have died yes. which means that without going into it the interests of india are being equated with the interests of those who are beneficiaries that is the 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 crux of that i understand i am that, that's the very well. but there are many uh, i understand in, very well there are many aspects uh, of this. can we move on to questions from the audience now any questions please raise your hand or ask the question directly i hope the technical snag has been solved now uh, oh yes uh, ratna sudarshan yes thank you very much ratna for that question yes that is the exactly you have written that i believe war ban, bonds were issued and they did not raise much that is very true um that uh, there was as keynes uh, recognized that there was very little progress with the war borrowing program these were his words and um in britain as i said they were able to raise an amount which matched the amount of act, of annual taxation through their borrowing program so there is this huge difference uh there is another question sir which says what were the reasons behind this differential impact of world war on bengal and punjab countryside after all why one region faced prosperity whereas the other famine like situation from saurav kumar rai yes again that is an important and good question uh <clears throat> and again there would be several reasons one reason for famine in bengal is that it is close to the war front and after the fall of burma there is a fear that the japanese will invade india as well uh, if the japanese can conquer singapore the other great colonial port city then why can they not conquer calcutta for example in a situation where invasion is expected people will stock extra food so if one bag of rice is put aside for an emergency maybe two or three will be kept now as sen has written if there there is not so much of a shortfall in production but there is a great shortfall in market release so famine conditions can be created when many people withhold putting stocks on the market there is hoarding and other things as well so this is one reason why you have famine conditions created in bengal one reason is the fear of um, of the area becoming um, Uh, a theater 
of battle. There is another reason which I try to explain, which is that the vulnerability is really of agricultural labor. Now, agricultural labor at that time is not so prominent in Punjab. That is a later phenomenon. Agricultural labor in this period stretches in its intensity in a belt from South India along the coast to the eastern region. Uh, and it is agricultural labor which suffers in this at this time. Uh, war also leads to military remittances into Punjab. Uh, pension, uh, well, salaries are sent home to some degree. Uh, there is a surplus food grain uh, production in Punjab, so that fetches higher prices. That's these are the reasons behind the differential impact. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Narendra Yadav yes. wants to ask a question. He says, uh, British, uh, British declared war aims. These were different for British and Indian people. Can you address what impact these war aims have on Indian people? My sense is that the British people uh, have a certain patriotic sentiment which obviously cannot be there in Indian society uh, when a colonial state is, in, is involved. Uh, so the war aims are, of course, as far as the government of India is concerned, prosecuting the war is one aim, but also it is the defense of India from invasion, uh, which is something which a fairly large section of Indian society would be uh, panicky about. So the, the war aims are obviously different, but what I wish to underline in all this is that perhaps we make too much of the difference which patriotism uh, can, uh, or the, the impact of patriotism. The call of the Congress during World War II was, the slogan was, na ek pai, na ek bhai. So nobody to be recruited, uh, nobody, no financial contribution to be made. Now, half of this in Indian society, we were willing to go along with no contribution. But if it came to bhai, then it meant that you were giving up a government job, which people would not do. Uh, at this time. And therefore, the point which I think a lot of reflection is needed on is that at this time of high national sentiment, still two and a half million people went into the Indian Army. Now, if you do a comparison of that with, let's say, the jail capacity of India, the, these are figures which one can get. The jail capacity of India is about two lakhs. So if the non, if the Gandhian movements had been able to put two lakh people into jail, the jails would be full and what would the colonial state be able to do? At the same time, at the height of this nationalist sentiment, two and a half million people are able to join the army. So there is in, I think, analyzing Indian history, uh, the stated aims are sometimes less important than the material interests of our people. And uh, the further point I make would like to make is that our history writing doesn't recognize this enough. We make much more of people who decline ICS or government jobs, whereas for most people in India, the state, colonial state, national state is a much desired employer. But in our history writing, we always talk about people who have rejected such jobs. So um, I have gone around this a little bit but what I'm saying is that declared aims matter much less than uh, social interests. Any other question or comment? Well, I think we have come to an end of this session. Uh, once again, I thank all members of uh, the audience for their very enthusiastic participation in this lecture. And uh, 
I reiterate that it was a great honor and privilege for us to have Professor Indivar Kamtekar here with us today. And he has given a wonderful lecture, very original, very powerful argument with which uh, we uh, substantially agree. And, and uh, I, I, I sincerely thank him for accepting our invitation and delivering this lecture. And I do hope that uh, he will visit us again, uh, not in very distant future, and speak to us. Thank, thank you, you very this. much, sir. Thank you for this and thank you to the audience for attending. Thank, thank you. you.